You are now in America with Bento Gudinho. I'm a self-proclaimed missionary to the United States. I'm here to save American souls and American souls only. That's right, my friends. This show is brought to you by Christian Podcast LLC in partnership with Palm Harvest Church in Costa Mesa, California. Visit us on our website at christianpodcast.com. Check out our emoji belief meter christianpodcast.com. Like, subscribe, and share to this episode. It really helps people discover our content. Here we go. All right, my friends. Well, today is a beautiful day and we have a special guest. We're going to be talking about what stories are worth telling. Is your story worth telling? And today we have a special guest from 168 Project, John David Ware. How are you? Welcome to the show, John. Hey, Beto. Oh, sorry. I had you on mute. <laughs> Let's do that again. How are you, John? Doing great. Good to see you, Beto. Awesome. Welcome to the show, man. Um, I mean, I think today I want to talk about storytelling. I want to talk about risk taking. And I want to talk about a little bit of how the, the cinema industry or the movie industry has changed and shifted in the last few years. And even you were telling me that you're now in Georgia. And I think that's a little bit part of that, that sh shift how uh, media has changed. But first of all, John, would you introduce our audience a little bit to who you are, a little bit of what you do and what 68 Project is? Sure. Um, I'm John David Ware. I'm a writer, director, producer, actor. And um, I have a couple of films that uh, are on Amazon right now. One's called Unbridled. It's a horse film. It's about a girl who's been abused and so she's in a horse therapy program and that's unbridled starring uh eric roberts tc stallings tia mckay and uh it's it was especially great because i got to cast people from the feeder which is 168 film project and in fact we are one week right now we're one week away from the film festival which will have probably been gone by the time this airs, but definitely there will be repercussions and, and just great things that come out of that. Um, the other film I have on uh, Amazon and uh, all other streaming places is uh, Final Frequency, and Final Frequency is a film inspired by Nikola Tesla, the inventor, Serbian inventor, and uh, it basically asks the question, what if... <laughs> Nikola Tesla had a secret notebook and it fell into the wrong hands. Mm. And uh, so it's a semi campy sci fi thriller, high concept, low budget. You'll love it. You got to check it out. <laughs> so that's, it. that's what I do in my spare time, if there is such a thing. But um, right now, uh, the 168 Film Project is in its 20th year and it's our 19th competition, 19th film festival. 18 of those have been in LA and this one we moved to Trillith in it's near Fayetteville, Georgia, which is about 20 minutes south of Atlanta. And um, we are uh, just building a new foundation down here. Still got roots in LA, of course, but um, the foundation is very, very exciting down here. There's a lot of way more interest and respect for films with faith elements than I find in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, you know, you tell people, you meet on the street what you do, and you, when you get to the faith part of it, you know, sometimes you get, you know, great responses, but more often it's like, oh, oh, okay. 
a great, you know, so, <laughs> you know, it's just a different kind of uh, mindset here in the Bible Belt. And um, I like, it. you know, I, I met Gene Simmons in an airport one time and I was telling him about the 168 film project and uh, I gave him a DVD and he's looking at it. And I said, yeah, Gene, you know, the guy from Kiss is the front man of Kiss, mm. world famous Gene Simmons. So I was like, yeah, Gene, you know, we, we, we've been doing this for, at the time, we've been doing it for 13 years. And I said, we've been doing it for 13 years. We've made thousands, thousands of filmmakers have made hundreds of films. And right now we, we've made 1,200 of these films since 2003. But at the time I said, Gene, yeah, people, they pour their heart and soul into it and they make films that are 10 to 10 to 11 minutes long he's like yeah <laughs> and i said and everybody you know gets a prize at the end we get prizes for all you know categories of technical and artistic merit and we have this giant film festival and red carpet award show vip after party he's like yeah and i'm like and yeah and all the films are based on a bible verse <laughs> and he looks up from the DVD and he's like, Christian? And I said, Christian. And he hands the DVD back to me and he says, the world don't want Christian. Wow. That was the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Who would have thought? I mean, uh, yeah, I guess I guess we kind of saw it coming, but yeah. Wow, that, that says a lot. And this is where I'm going to go right now. I just want to start with an emoji reaction to everything you've said so far. Because that's what we do on this show. We start with the belief-o-meter. So out of our five emojis, I'm going to pick one from the gods of Emojitron and see how we start our show today. So belief-o-meter, here we go. And it's a divine emoji, divine emoji. John, how do you feel about getting the divine emoji, the coveted? I mean, this is kind of like the 68 awards. This is the Christian Podcast Awards. <laughs> you know, I'm feeling pretty good about myself right now, Beto. I have to say that the divine is what I have been going for for quite a while. Wow. And I give you props to... Yes. I will say one thing. Gene Simmons, you know, when he said the world don't want Christian and the conversation was over, that really translated into he couldn't figure out how he was going to make money on it. Mm. I think that's the bottom line. Wow. The bottom line is the bottom line. Wow. There you go, my friends. We kick off with the divine emoji with John David Ware. And John, I mean, I have so many questions about the, the film industry, but I think as you talk about this, almost like a divine encounter, you know, I mean, the, the, the lead singer of Kiss and kind of like his rejection in a sense to, I would say maybe the Christian message overall. Uh, but at the same time, you said you've been doing this for 20 years, right? I mean, that's faithfulness. Uh, props to you and the team. It's, it's not easy to do, right? And I guess the overall theme today that I want to talk about is why are these films, why are these, why is like the, the films that, that 168 Project uh, showcases, why are these stories that are worth telling, you know? And um, I would love to start right there. You know, as you talk about the awards that you give, as you talk about, you know, the the design concepts, you know, just the the maybe the acting, the storytelling components, the screenplay. Um, what do you look for when you are looking for a story that's compelling, a story that you say, wow, there's something behind this, even if it's a lower budget type of movie, but the story is great. What makes a story great? Um. That's a lot, a, a lot to ask in one setting. I mean, I could talk for hours on that, but um, the thing that makes our stories most worth telling is that they're based on God's word. 
Um, so, you know, we have, uh, we have expert all the way down to rank beginner filmmakers. So, you know, we show all the films and so, but the truth is, you know, even with a beginning filmmaker, they're, they're basing their film on the word of God. So there's something divine, divine emoji in that film, in that story. So um, right there, you know, you've got just, if, if not the best sound, the best acting, the best uh, pictures, you've got the best communication, which comes from the heart of God. And so that's exciting right there. And, you know, when people go to our film fest, they'll see all the films from the, the smallest to the greatest. And they'll, they'll see after each one, they'll see a Bible verse that is uh, voiced and keyed on the screen. And we've got the greatest voice that, that says our Bible, the, vo the voice of God, so to speak, his name's Phil Crowley. And he is the voice of Shark Tank on a lot of those episodes. So it's really cool just to hear his voice. But um, he'll, he'll voice all of the scriptures. And this is our theme this year. I don't know if you can. It's a little blurry. It. <laughs> it, says, it says restoration. Okay. Oh, there. I see it. Yeah. If it's next to your face, it shows. <laughs> there we go. Restoration. Restoration is the theme this year for 2022. And so, um, you know, last year's theme was storms, right? Because all the garbage we were going through and phony baloney stuff. So we had, as a hopeful thematic element, restoration. Let's, let's have some of that. Who doesn't want some of that? Hmm. So all the, the all the films this year are very hopeful, and uh, we have some exciting stuff. The one that's leading the nominations in 2022 was a uh, a speed musical, which you know you're like, well, oh, how do you do that, and how do you do an animation in 168 hours as well? And hmm. but they did them, and um, they're good, and. Really, really exciting stuff. We've got uh, filmmakers coming from, of course, all over the U.S. We've got them coming from Ecuador, wow. where there's a, uh, I think it's it's either the second or third top nominee getter um, from uh, Quito, Ecuador. And then we've got a really, really tight animation from Canada. And then we've got a couple of films that were produced by a missionary in Milano, Italy. Wow. So they're all coming and uh, they're real excited to, you know, check out the new Hollywood, so to speak, you know, if that's what you want to call uh, Atlanta and Trillith. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's like we hang out at this coffee shop every day where I am now. It's called Rome, R-O-A-M. And I see, you know, you never know who you're going to meet here. You know, I met... Uh, uh, Matumbo, the, the Kimbe Matumbo, he was like seven foot three or something like that. The basketball a, player? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was wow. here last time I was here. Nice. And I'm like, wow, the Kimbe Matumbo. And, uh, you know, you just meet all kinds of stars on both sides of the camera. And, you know, that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like LA in a, in a way that way. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're having a lot of fun down here. That's for sure. Why? And then you got that southern, southern hospitality mm. that is just so great. Everybody's wants to know your name, and they're always glad you came. And so it's it's been fun. Love it. Well, you so you're basing. This is so cool about the 168 project. So for the people that don't know, um, let's just say it's a film festival. It is, uh, and it awards some of the films that are made. But the challenge is that you need to make the film in 168 hours which is one week right and i mean that part of the process it's it's so inspiring it's so amazing because who does that right i mean when you think of any type of project i mean just just think of uh you no know, producing any sort of media 
you always consider, man, this is going to take a while, right? As a media producer, I think of projects that you know, take me months to finish, right? So to have something done in 168 hours, and then like you said, you have all kinds of ranges of, of uh, level of production, right? So you have the, the high level production, maybe higher budget to the, you know, entry level, and you're both in the same. So how do you balance that um, when, when it comes to like uh, awarding these films? How do you balance? Do your eyes tend to go to the, oh, maybe this one had more budget and it's more eye catching versus this other one? Or do both equally have a same opportunity to to get an award? Like how, how is that? How do you well, balance I mean, that? You know, we, we are grading the films on 10 categories, essentially. Um, <clears throat> the biggest category is called scriptural integration. And what that means is, in, and again, that's 20% of the filmmakers grade from the judges. Um, scriptural integration means, okay, you get this randomly assigned Bible verse on assignment day. And um, what the writers then have to do is to integrate the scripture into the story as a synopsis. So they'll, you know, like, take an example. Jesus wept is one of the shortest, if not the shortest verse in the Bible. And so to, to have good SI, as we say, uh, you'd have someone weeping or someone showing a lot of sadness and then extra credit for, excuse me, getting the context of the verse in chapter. So that's a big part of what we do. And, you know, th therefore you get people who don't necessarily regard the Bible as God's word, looking at God's word and saying, what's the deal? Is this relevant? Is it, is it speak to my life? Hmm. And I'm very happy about that fact because, you know, if people take a look at the Bible, they're going to find a lot of truth to it, and they just might look deeper, and, and that would be a good thing for all parties concerned. So back to the process, though, um, what you have is the judging looks at technical, scriptural integration, story, and all the elements that go into making a film, you know, sound design, production design editing, all that. And so we'll give awards on all those categories as well. And um, so beginner and expert films are quickly, you know, um, numerically categorized because, you know, we rate the films on all, all 10 categories. And, you know, typically what I see is, um, you know, pe people's scales are different, but I'm getting like, like mid to high 80s are going to be the best films. Sometimes you get some that get into the low 90s. Um, some judges like 10, 10, 10 all over. I'm like, no, nothing's worth a 10. There's no 10s in my book, Wow, you know, on this earth. But, um, you know, certainly eights and nines, that's, that's uh, quite possible. But so, so beginners and experts, it's very quickly ascertained what what category people are in and you know there are some sometimes you get standouts in, in a really beginner film you'll get a you'll get a an actor that's great or maybe the sound is great or even you know the cinematography mm. but um back to the the process they also not just get 168 hours before that they go through the scripture or the um, verse assignment, and that marks the start of the clock. And the first clock is 10 days of pre-production. They can't write before they get these scriptures. And then once they get the scripture, they have 10 days to get ready. And that includes writing location schedules, rehearsals, everything except turning on the cameras and, and recorders. And, and then on go day, which is, on a Friday, 11 a.m. California time, they they start. They start shooting, and they shoot maybe for two, three days. Then they're directly into post. And then on the 167th or 
67th and a half hour, they better be starting to upload. And if they do, get it in on time. And if it's not over the total runtime limitation for their category, then they're eligible for awards and their team doesn't want to, you know, do bad things to them. <laughs> mm. Wow. That's so interesting. So I, I can only imagine that, I mean, the constraint of the time, you know, kind of puts the pressure of, I. it's almost like I got to go for it and this is what it is. Like there's no more adding or taking out this. I mean, here's the final product, right? And that, I mean, my, my, maybe my only concern, or maybe, maybe this even helps the future of the film. So let's say the, fi the film could have been better if it had more time, right? Maybe that, that's, this, that's the case for basically anything sure. in life, right? <laughs> You're writing yeah. a song. If you have more time, you could have done it better. But uh, when it comes to the film being showcased and then opportunities for the film to be featured, I don't know, in theatrical releases or things like that, Um, do you see the teams kind of like saying, hey, the film is great, but we got to revise it. Is that allowed, you know, or, or what happens after the film is done? Where have you seen it taken? Like, does it just die right there? Does it have opportunities uh, beyond the, the, the award ceremony? Or what are some of the, you know, maybe inspiring stories that are behind you know, some of these films that you've showed? Well, um The film, all of them have a life after um, the festival. And what we do is there's there's two versions that get turned in. The first one for us is a judging copy of the film. And that is what they did in 168 hours. Mm. Okay. And then we give them an additional week to clean it up, which means, oh, I spelled Jimmy's name wrong. Or, mm. you know, I left this guy off the credits or... You know, I want to do a color correct or I want to sweeten the sound. So they do all that. Give us a final version on a high res copy so we can show it and project it. And. Uh, but after uh, the festival is all over, you know, they they have perhaps nominations, perhaps awards that they can attach to their name. That's the lifeblood of a new filmmaker is what wh who are you? You know, what have you done? Oh, I, I'm a, I'm I'm a filmmaker is not as impressive as I'm an award-winning filmmaker. Mm. So we do that for them. I'm nominated 12 nominations for my short film. You want to have lunch? You know, mm. you want to see my film? Okay, so we do that. And then there's certain standout films that have gone viral for sure. Um, the Italian missionary I was talking about did a film in 2006. And it was called uh, Cinque Minuti. Mm. And that means five minutes. And it's the story of a man claiming to be Jesus Christ himself. Mm. And he goes up to a bridge where a girl's just about to kill herself by jumping. And he says, ciao, of course, because he's Italian. And uh, it's in Italian. And he goes through all the reasons why he loves her. And she ends up, you know, not jumping, of course. And uh, it's a beautiful film. It won best film over, you know, over a film that, you know, was technically head and shoulders above. And, and additionally, a, a really great story as well. But um, there's just something about this film. And so Cinque Minuti, C-I-N-Q-U-E-M-I-N-U-T-I, You can find it online. It's free. You can watch it. And um, it's been downloaded like 20 million times. It's been translated wow. into about 25, 27 languages. And it's just the story of, uh, you know, what if Jesus Christ came down and and found us in a really bad way and, and reached out his hand and said, let's take a walk. I want to tell you how much I love you. I want to tell you how special you really are. Mm. Wow, that's so good. That's so inspiring. And so when, when I think of risks, I mean, one of the risks is even telling a story that's about the Bible, right? I mean, that's the first risk I would say when, when you're saying all these films are based on a Bible verse that's, that's um, attached to each of the stories, right? So that's incredible. And you kind of saw, you know, as you mentioned with the, with the story with the kids guy, that is not easy, right? I mean, it's challenging. So when I think of risk... 
I was listening the other day or actually reading an interview of Matt. No, I was I was watching because he was on a YouTube show where they eat wings that are hot and then they put different sauces on them. And so they were interviewing Matt Damon and he was kind of talking about how the industry has changed. And he said back in the days when we were making films, uh, the DVD was a thing, right? So you not only had the film going on theatrical, theatrical releases, but then a few months later you had the DVDs and that's where we were really, it was almost like another release of the film where we were still making income. But the, the funny thing about it is that he was actually talking about um, filmmakers are not taking risks nowadays because of the money, right? The, the, we're not going to make that kind of mom money if we tell this type of story, right? Because we need nowadays we need to make immense amounts of money in order for a film to be successful and to be able, you know, to hire whomever actor and then share some of that to with you know the the theaters that are gonna release the the movie and stuff like that. So he was saying, before I can make a profit, I need to make a film that's a hundred million dollars worth, right? So what stories are a hundred million dollars worth telling, right? So on that end, I feel like, man, that would be such a risk to tell any story, right? I mean, you would probably do your research, but when it comes to the Bible, I feel like you're taking the risk. And how does that relate to you? Like when you hear like Damon, like a, a, a famous actor who's probably grew up in, in the LA era, right? Like you said, and now moving to to Atlanta, how do you see the industry changing and, and what inspires you about maybe the change that you're witnessing um, that's changing, that's helpful for stories like the ones you're telling that maybe people are not risking, but you are risking in telling them? Yeah, well, I mean, risk is a relative thing. Um, you know, it might be risky and sometimes here, some places here, but in the grand scheme of things, in your eternal destiny, <laughs> you better be telling some stories that matter, my friend. Mm. So um, I would uh, I would say um, you know Hollywood always wants to know about things that make them obscene amounts of money. So that that'll never change. Hmm. Um, and you know you've seen certain films like there was a Christian film called uh, God's Not Dead there was another one called uh, I Can Only Imagine on a percentage basis they made obscene amounts of money I mean like you know 10,000 percent something like that some of the Kendrick brothers same thing um, their films so um, how have things changed? Uh, I don't know that they have. I mean, mm. Hollywood wants money. They want to find out who can get them that money. They will hire and promote people who can. Um, you know, and sometimes the, the films that they promote and make money with, it's it's not their favorite thing, you know? I think they're not, you know, it's like maybe maybe they, you know, look at Christian films like, you know, kind of like you got a dead cat on a string or something sometimes. <laughs> uh, and not all of them. There's, there's, you know, Christian folks and Christian friendly folks and Jewish folks in Hollywood. And they certainly like this. But, you know, I don't think everybody has a good uh, fuzzy warm feeling for Christianity. I know they don't. You know, some people just think it's, you know, ridiculous and bigoted and all this stuff. And, you know, I would say they probably haven't explored it enough to to find out that, that these are good people and there's good people everywhere, you know. So you just have to see where they are. The Bible says God judges the heart. And, you know, we can't know the heart, but, you know, we can try to understand where people are coming from and that's that's what we try to do but um the one thing that you know you ask about how do we see the industry changing um i think 
what 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 has refreshed me here is just that people are way more open to films of faith, uh, Christianity um, here than they are in LA. I think um, it's perhaps going to be easier to raise funds here. We shall see. You know, I haven't really mm. done uh, anything but make a killer film festival so far. So um, I, the, the jury's still out. I'll let you know what I find in <laughs> the coming months and years. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. I think I think you're onto something because I, I honestly feel like maybe there's a new revival and it's a media revival and you had to be taken out of Hollywood to make it happen, right? And go to a place where you're welcome, where the message is welcome. I think it's almost like when Jesus sends the disciples and says, you're going to go in pairs and you're going to knock on doors. And if they welcome you, stay there and share and you know, have a feast. But if they don't, shake the dust off your feet and go somewhere else. So in a sense, I think maybe that's a little bit of what's happening to the industry in America, right? The film industry is saying, hey, Hollywood is not really welcoming this type of messages, but guess what? In Georgia, there's a new media revival, right? And it's happening. So, I mean, that kind of makes me excited because I think the work of God doesn't stop. And, you know, even like, I, I mean, I would love to get your take a little bit on, on like studios like Amazon, right? Like Amazon Studios just released the, the I call it the Lady of the Rings, because it's not really the Lord of the Rings. And I don't know, people might have their own opinions on it and whatever. But I think, man, it, it just didn't make sense for me when I was watching this new show, right? And to think that they put incredible amounts of money, like billions of dollars into this story and the marketing. And like, you know, you got an Amazon package in your home and it said, watch the, the Rings of Power now streaming on Amazon, right? And I mean... I don't want to judge a movie and just say, oh, man, it's bad and whatever, because I've been learning that, you know, whoever puts effort into an art, it should be, in a sense, you know, be appreciated. But at the same time, I feel like even if you put a lot of money behind a project, that doesn't mean that the story is good. And especially if you're basing it off on a story that's already written and you twist it and you change it and it doesn't honor the original author of the story, I feel like you're talking about something completely different, right? That's why I say, uh, I was thinking, man, if they call this show like Galadriel and the Rings of Power, I could watch it because then it's not about the Lord of the Rings, right? Maybe based on the Lord of the Rings, but it's a different film, like all of its sounds like that's, to me, like from my vantage point, it has nothing to do with the original author, even when I watched no, Lord of the Rings by uh, Peter Jackson, I think it was. Um, It's nothing to do, right? It's like day and light, uh, one from the other. So when when it comes to the movies that you're seeing coming out of Hollywood, right? Even like you're saying maybe, let's say, let's put it this way. Let's say the light, it's kind of like being taken out of Hollywood and brought into Georgia. Have you been noticing that films have been getting worse in a sense when it comes to to the stories they're telling. Uh, do you see any of that? Like, you see like, man, this the, are they hard to watch for you on the very least, right? Because they are for me. I don't know if like as a producer, yeah. do you see that happening? Stuff. I mean, go go to Netflix. You'll see some horrific stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, network TV as well, I think. It's just, you know, people, people are sick of it. A lot of people and um, certainly Christian people. And, you know, I... There are some producers that that have waked, woken up. They're woke in a good sense <laughs> to the to the uh, the truth that people, you know, they want something. I mean, that there's a reason people are watching TV Land, you know, and watching Mayberry, you know, the Andy Griffith Show. There is a reason that that you know you can you can get your your family to watch that, and you're not going to be, you know you know, dealing with Johnny wanting to be, you know, Joni, you know, at some point. It, it's like you you have wholesome things and, you know, corny is a little bit corny, yeah. But um, you just have, 
you know, wholesome is the new edgy. Mm. Wow. You know, awesome. so uh, I, I think there is a huge hunger for good content that, that, that doesn't offend. So I think, you know, the, the studios that get that are going to be well re rewarded. I really think that. And, uh, you know, there's always going to be people that want to push the envelope and people that, you know, want to see gratuities in, in film. But there's, there's a probably much bigger crowd that, you know, doesn't go to movies and doesn't watch TV because they don't want to see that. Mm. And so I think, you know, waking waking people up to that reality with economic truth, you know, where I'm like, okay, yeah, I made this film. There's no, there's no gratuitous sex language or violence in it. And it made a ton of money. Give me more money to make more of these films. And they'd say, oh yeah, for sure. Here you go. Mm. So, um, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, you've got the Irwin, <coughs> Irwin brothers, you know about them, right? Who are they? I'm maybe not. Okay, well, the Irwin brothers have been making really good films for a while. And uh, Lionsgate got wind of that and said, hey, you guys, we really like what you're doing. Why don't you come make films for us? Mm. You know? <laughs> and so they did. They gave them a huge deal. And um, that is a secular studio coming to Christians because they're excellent. Mm. And... I just saw a movie that's as yet unreleased. It's called Jesus Revolution. And it's yes. based on a Do you know about it? Yes. Yeah, they've been filming okay. right around here on um, Corona del Mar in Orange, California. Yeah, and it's it's from up in that area, Carpinteria, I think. And um, they, they had, you know, a couple of pastors up there. I want to say 70s, but Chuck Lorre was one of them. As a young man, he was growing up, you know, um, cutting his teeth and learning who Jesus is, learning who he is. Chuck Smith was the old stodgy pastor played by Kelsey Grammer and mm. uh, excellent acting, excellent performances. And so um, what happened was, you know, there was this hippie movement up at that time in the 60s, 70s. And, um, you know, the old kind of set in their ways, stodgy old Christian folk in this church, they didn't really want, you know, kind of scruffy, you know, dirty hippies coming to their church, right? So, well, the pastor's daughter brings one of these hippies, and his name is Lonnie Frisbee, and just an on-fire Christian, but he was a hippie, and, and kind of a, kind of weird, kind of out there, kind of a flower child, and so Kelsey Grammer's character, Chuck Smith, had a decision to make. He said, okay, well, I could either let this hippie in and lose some of my big donors and lose some of my church people, or I could shut them out and keep the church people happy. And so needless to say, he, he let the hippie in, and the hippie brought more hippies, and soon it was these gigantic tent revivals with all these hippies you know and um it's a, it's a really really i'm like I, I, I watched the film it made me laugh it made me cry i'm like yes that's what christian films should be going towards you know mm. telling real stories in a great way and you know i still don't think we have seen what god can do on film and tv in our mm. lifetime i wow. hope to be a part of making that come true and seeing the greatest films ever produced in my lifetime that have, guess what? They have a faith backbone. They have a Christian worldview mm. and there's nothing that is going to detract because of that. They mm -hmm. will be excellent in, in, in storytelling, in acting, in message, in, what they do for the culture. It's going to be a home run. Wow. I love that. I, that's so hopeful. And I think I agree with you. Like when I think of, for example, the Chronicles of Narnia or even the Lord of the Rings, 
I feel like as great as they are, they're they're a thing of the past, right? They're stories that already were written and films that were already made. And I feel like a lot of the sentiment, even with, with I'm just going to call them secular studios, it's like, let's remake this great story from the past. Even Disney, right? They're remaking a bunch of movies, right? That were maybe cartoons and now they're making like the real life uh, version of them. And part of me feels like just as a, as a normal human who loves to watch stories is like, can somebody come up with a new story? Like, is everything going to be a remake of something great in the past? And I think what you're saying gives me so much hope because I think that's what I inspire. I feel like let's let's maybe the writer, the great writers of of the future films are writing the greatest stories right now that maybe nobody knows about. And then you know, some filmmaker will hear the story, find the story and say, this is worth telling we got to put this on on the screen so that everybody can see it and that's when a movie right like a story becomes inspiring that's when a movie really can even shape a generation i would say like would you say um would you say media has the capability to maybe rekindle a generation in a sense what do you think media does to to the audiences yeah i think uh kids have always been animated by what they see on film and TV. You know, what do you grow up with? That's going to shape your, what you joke about and who you are. Mm. We grew up watching Monty Python, you know? Mm. So, you know, we're, we're always talking about uh, the cheese shop that has no cheese in it. And, you know, the ministry of silly walks, you know, I mean, it's, it, it is, you know, it's the common experience that, people get when they watch TV and go to class the next day and say, Oh, did you see that? Oh yeah, it was stupid. And the other guy says, Oh no, I loved it. You're stupid yourself, you know, and <laughs> that's kind of, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it's that shared experience uh, that creates the culture. I love it. So what would you say, I guess my last question before going to our emojis is when you think of, of having a faith, backbone for the new stories that are going to be told what would you say the maybe just to to open up even the secular audience to say when you think of a christian movie this is the backbone of it this is this is the part that's going to be the inspiring part this is the part that's going to move the fibers of your heart that even as a as an atheist even there, you're going to be touched because it has this. So what would you say is that that backbone? Is there something to describe it? Is there something that that's unique to the faith movies that you can say, if it has these elements, it will be inspiring? Um, well, I mean, there, there's the word of God, of course, that's, that's always inspiring. And it is, I mean, the story, the, the art of story is typically about the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And um, the Jesus Christ story is the hero's journey. And E.T., hero's journey. Braveheart, hero's journey. Um, Star Wars, hero's journey. It's all the same because it's it's the Christ story. And that is really at the core of what animates humans, we need a savior. And so we want to see the story of a savior that, you know, um, had a really bitter cup placed before him to drink. And initially he was like trying to get out of it. Jesus prayed in the garden, you know, sweating tears of drops of blood. He, there is a condition, a medical condition, where people sweat blood, and that's what the Bible describes. So he's sweating blood, and he's saying, Father, if this cup can pass from me, and I, and I don't have to drink this of this death, then let that be. But nevertheless, thy will be done. So, you know, that's the beginning of the hero's journey, when the hero reluctantly accepts the charge, you know. Luke, his family is killed, and then he accepts the charge to fight and 
to overcome what has been done to him, you know, to, to destroy the Death Star. He accepts the charge. So at the end of that journey, you know, the the hero, the the savior sacrifices himself for the good of others. And that is again exactly Jesus Christ's story. And mm. you know, people see the parallel because it's right there when you lay it over when you overlay, you know, Jesus Christ story over any good story that's worth its salt, you'll have the hero's journey. So mm. that's what it's about. Um, that wow. hero's journey. And, and of course, good artistry is, is a huge part of that. If you don't have good sounds, good pictures, good acting, yada, 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 you've got, you know, a, a film that's starting to, you know, take you out of the experience. So that that whole package has to be there, starting number one with a great story with a hero's journey in it, and maybe mm -hmm. a monster. I always like to put monsters and explosions in my films. <laughs> monsters, I love it, and I think you know if I would use my wife's words. When it comes to, you know, we're watching a movie and if the movie is inspiring, if the movie um, has those elements of hope and of triumph, I, I can't help but she always says something like, oh, they stole that from the Bible, right? And I think what she means is it's really a, a hero's journey story. I mean, the Bible is full of those, right? People who, who sacrifice themselves, people who you know, put others before them. And, and I think that's why it's so moving, right? When you see a movie that, that kind of portrays that and that some people might, might even relate it to. Maybe it's totally unrelated to the Bible, but you see the elements of hope, the elements of sacrifice, the elements of overcoming struggle that for Christians is like evident that, oh, that's, that's kind of like Jesus Christ, right? What he did. Um, so that's beautiful. And... Okay, so we're going to go to our emoji reactions to finish the episode. And what that is like is first we're going to go to our blasphemous emoji. So out of our five emojis, John, for blasphemous, what are you, what would you say is like the most blasphemous idea you can think of that's out there in the film industry? Ah, wow, well, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I think the the most universal uh, thing that's out there is that you know, I mean, on a general, very general thing is we don't need God, and we are all alone on this planet, and it 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 it. it there was a big bang and boom, you know, all this came up. <laughs> that is completely ridiculous and um, self-defeating. If you try to go and prove the big bang, you can't. It's it's more religion than religion. So uh, I, I think that you could look at many ways that permeates itself uh, into the, the media and TV and it's about people wanting to be their own God, not having to bow down or, um, you know, uh, give thanks, uh, just not having any responsibility. So I think, yeah, that's, that's my blasphemous <laughs> emoji. <laughs> Love it. That makes a lot of sense. Let's move on to the skeptical. So a skeptical emoji is, again, in the film industry, why are you still skeptical of, or where do you see skepticism played out? Skepticism. Um, I think, uh, you mean like the audience or the filmmakers or what? Whatever, whichever, just, or why are you skeptical of, it could be too. I'm very skeptical of the lies that I'm seeing in the media and uh, the things that they're asking us asking us to swallow 
that are completely obvious lies as related to our health care and health and war and peace and just filthy lies coming a mile a minute every day. I'm tired of it. All right. Skeptical about the media. That makes sense. Inspired. So things get better. Inspire emoji. Where do you see inspiration or what inspires you in the film industry? Oh, gosh. There's there's really good stuff coming out. Uh, the Chosen has been kind of a, a an exciting thing. Um, and I think Jesus Revolution is, as I as I remarked before, has been, uh, it's like, you're like, okay, I'm checking off boxes and, and that checks off a lot of boxes. Mm. Whereas, you know, Christian films in the past, maybe haven't been able to check off all those boxes. So I'm excited about that and inspired as well. Wow, that's so good. Um, love it. Next one, one to the last is holy. So what's a holy idea in the film industry? Um, the, uh, the holy idea is, uh, let's, let's ask people to have an honest look at their lives and the life of Jesus Christ and say, what do you think? You know? see more films about that mm, I love it and lastly the divine emoji what's the most divine idea you can think of in the film industry um, well I think it would be a divine blessing for God's people to work together. And um, that is one thing that we're, we're facilitating with 168 Film Project. 168film.com is our website. And, um, you know, getting Christians to work together, whether it turns out good or bad, you learn. And uh, iron sharpens iron. And we try to deal with everybody's rough edges until you know we can figure out how to treat each other kindly even you know if that's not deserved so much so working together is pretty divine That's so good, my friends. Working together is pretty divine. I love it. So I just want to say, check us out at christianpodcast.com. Check out our belief o meter Choose your own emoji to see how your faith is from blasphemous to divine. Again, my name is Beto Gudiño. Please like, subscribe, share this episode. Follow us on Roku TV, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok. We're everywhere now. So give us a like, give us a follow if this content has been helpful for you. And John, so you were saying, um, where can people go find out more about the 168 Project? Yeah, 168film.com. Um, we have a uh, upcoming Rite of Passage screenwriting competition. And that's coming up in January, February, and uh, it's a uh, mentored competition where we uh, get uh, six writers to a mentor. They pass their drafts back and forth, and they make 12 pages in one week. Not too hard. And we've got some cash prizes for that. And uh, uh, I have been been told it's life changing. Um, regarding uh, the journey of a, a writer in the media. And, um, you know, it's all, again, we, we base it on a theme of verse in a week, but instead of making an entire film, it's just 12 pages you write. So very doable, very great for beginners. 
and uh, I hope we we get some people coming in out of the Beto Budino show. Woo-hoo. All right, and can anybody from anywhere in the world like find you guys out and subscribe to the you know to the to the upcoming events and all of that, or is it only America? No, no, we we value our worldwide participation. Like I said, we got Ecuador, Italy, Canada involved this year, and we've had you know probably 50 different countries involved with our competition. So wow, right, awesome. Them. All right, thank you, John. Thank you for being on the show. I'll see you guys on the next one. <laughs>